Well, I think we are ready to get started. So hi, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. How are you all doing today? You having fun? Academy is a fun place to explore. Certainly, we have a lot of really great life on display. And um, you know, a lot of the scientists that take care of that life here um, are kind of behind the scenes. But in addition to those scientists, we have scientists that are exploring life all around the world, ex including the really interesting information that that life around the world uh, has and is based on, like studying their DNA. And so in the variety of labs that are behind the scenes, uh, we have some researchers that are assisting in that effort of studying DNA and genomics. And the lead guy is actually joining us right here today. His name is Brian Simonson. Can we give, all, can we give Brian a big round of applause? It's great that he's joined us today. Thanks so much for being here, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. It's always good to get out of the lab. Right. <laughs> I always enjoy it when Jeff pulls me out of the lab and I get out here and join the visitors of the Academy. It's fantastic to see all of you. Yeah, cool. So a, c a couple quick things before we get into the conversation. Um, we are filming this program and streaming it online. If you like kind of the idea of exploring uh, these chat programs that we do with a different scientist every week, then you can see these uh, streamed online every Thursday at 1230. Uh, you can go to just ustream.tv to check that out and the Cal Academy channel. And then also, in addition to that, we'll be filming it with a different camera that's actually meant to be taking video for a promotional film being made by the Academy. Okay, so if you all are interested in not being filmed for that, you don't want you don't want to appear in that film, then you can just talk to this guy over here, Grant, uh, and his partner Shauna, who may be joining us soon, and we'll just make sure that you're not in that film. Okay, so just a quick little announcement about that. But back to the matter at hand, Brian. Hi, um, you uh, work in the Center for Comparative Genomics, which I imagine may be familiar with some people, but less familiar with others. So first of all, can you tell us what is DNA, which is this swirling little thing we have right behind you right here. What is DNA, and what is comparative genomics? OK. Um, yeah, I am director of the Center for Comparative Genomics. I uh, went to undergraduate school at UC San Diego, and I studied, studied genetics and physiology. Then I came here to Berkeley to study evolutionary biology and molecular evolution. And I got lucky enough to get a job here at a research institution like the California Academy of Sciences. So I think most of you probably know what DNA is, but essentially it's just a piece of information. It's a source of information, and it's made up of four different molecules, A's, G's, C's, and T's, which we call bases, and they're strung together in enormously long strings of bases. The human genome has 3.2 billion of these bases. So it's filled with information. And the way it codes for information, for example, if you take three of those bases next to each other, every combination codes for a different amino acid. So G, G, T codes for some amino acid, and the next three will code for a different amino acid, and they string the amino acids together to form a protein. So the DNA is basically an information source that we pass on down the road. And comparative genomics is um, the comparison of whole genomes, that's all of your DNA, to each other or between different organisms or even within, organism, within an individual. So you can compare the DNA of a normal cancer or a normal cell and a cancer cell and see what has gone wrong. So comparative genomics is sort of a broad term, but here we use it to compare different organisms to each other and reconstruct their histories. Right. And, and um, you know, the, sorry. The just, sorry, I was just going to say, feel yeah. free to stop me and ask questions right. as I go. Yeah, this and is a chat. your life histories that you kind of just mentioned, we have in some ways visualized here. These are helpful uh, tools that researchers use to kind of understand relationships between species and, and what you were just saying. Um, so what exactly is this? How would you describe how it works? And how do scientists use a tool like this to kind of understand what it is they're studying? So there are many ways to study biology. Here at the Academy, we mostly study biodiversity. We want to know what creates biodiversity, what destroys biodiversity, and what maintains it. And the best way to do that is in the framework of history. In order to know what's causing speciation or what's causing extinction is to know the history of these organisms. So we use DNA to reconstruct these evolutionary historical trees. And for us, it's important to know who's related to who because we're naming new species and discovering new species. And if they're not really new species, their DNA is exactly the same. They just have different colors. Like you can look around this building. There's people with red hair and dark hair and light hair and tall and short. There's many different variations. But if you put all the dark haired people together and all the blonde haired people together, you wouldn't call them two different species. They look different, but they're not different species. And we can learn this by looking at the DNA. 
Right. And so what are some of the high-tech tools that are used in the Center for Comparative Genomics in the lab that uh, are available for the researchers here based at the Academy? So I think the biggest advances that are being made recently that have come out of the Human Genome Project are the DNA sequencers. These are the things that reconstruct the DNA and let us know what the DNA sequence is for a particular gene or a particular region of the genome. And the advances are astonishing right now. We're in the middle of a genomics revolution. Actually, we're at the beginning of a genomics revolution. And the biggest impact is in medicine. It is exploding right now. Um, but for us, the big benefit of this revolution is that we're getting more and more DNA for less and less money. And so the DNA sequencers are the primary innovator for what we do. There's a shot of the sequencer right there on the right. That's such a tiny little thing. Yields so much. And they're getting smaller and smaller and right. producing more and more data. Right. Yeah. So you mentioned the kind of this major uh, revolution in, in, in computational power that's advancing this genomics revolution. Um, what, I mean, kind of you mentioned we're at the beginning of it. I mean, wh where are we going? Like, wh what's, wh what can we expect in the, in the near future as far as what we're able to do with genomics? Well, like I said, medicine is getting impacted the most. And I think the future of genomics and medicine is going to be shocking. I mean, it won't be long, five to ten years, you're going to go in to the doctor and you're going to have your genome sequenced in a weekend. All of us will have our genome sequenced in a matter of no time. The Human Genome Project took 15 years and $3.8 billion to sequence 3.2 billion sequences. Now we can sequence the genome for thousands of dollars and we can do it over a weekend. And it took 15 years to do the first one and 3.8 billion. I can sequence Jeff's genome for a couple thousand dollars in like a week. So, and the cost, this is the cost, it's just incredibly less expensive than it used to be. So this technology is now available to universities and research institutions like the Academy, whereas before it was only available to huge government agencies. So the amount of DNA that we're getting and is available to us is really helping us understand biodiversity and evolution. And then if, if you do go to the doctor's office, let's say, and have your, your genome sequenced, how then are doctors using it to kind of help you and understand your health and maybe your future health? So there are many examples. A good example is cancer. We know that what happens in cancer is that there's a faulty gene that's producing one of these proteins that is producing too much or causing something else to produce too much. And so what we can do is use the human genome information to evaluate normal, let's say, liver cells versus a cancerous liver cell. And the way we do that is with a new technique called microarray. And if you can imagine, imagine a cornfield. And each stalk of corn represents a short piece of DNA for one gene. And there's about 25,000 genes. So we have a cornfield with 25,000 different pieces of DNA spread over a glass slide and nice even rows. And we would expose a normal liver cell to this. And the genes that are being turned on and off will stick to these little pieces of DNA. And we'll know which genes are being turned on during a normal liver cell. And then we do the same thing with a cancer cell. And then we will see which genes are being turned on that aren't normal, and then the doctors can focus on those genes, say, oh, we need to focus our attention on this gene, which is acting up, because we have all this information from microarray. And without knowing all the genes in the genome, we wouldn't be able to do this. So it's a really, it's a really fascinating science of life. I mean, it's, it's almost a, it's a computational science of life in some ways. You, you mentioned DNA is essentially information that's in our bodies. I mean, is it, is it really that comparable to computers, that this information in, in DNA is similar to information stored on a hard drive? It's actually very similar to computers. As you know, computers produce programs with binary codes, zeros and ones. You always hear zeros and ones. You see pictures of zeros and ones flying around commercials. Well, DNA code is four. It's, quad, it's quadrary. It's A's, G's, C's, and T's rather than zeros and ones, and it can code for tons of DNA and tons of information. Right. And part of the problem with this new revolution is the amount of data we're getting. We're getting file sizes and the multiple gigabytes, 10, 20, 30, 50 gigabyte files. Not even your best gaming home computer can open those files. They're just too darn big. So we're doing what's called clustering computers. We're taking hundreds of computers and crunching them to a single giant, what we call high performance computing clusters to process this data. And one example of the need for this is we saw in the trees behind us, if you can imagine, let's say we have 50 organisms, and we want to build trees for all 50 organisms. 
So what the computer has to do is it has to look at every single possible tree that could represent every possible relationship. Well, with 50 organisms, the total number of trees that represent every possible relationship is 10 to the 80th. That is a 10 followed by 80 zeros. That is more than the total number of atoms estimated for the entire universe. <laughs> so in order for a computer to look at every single tree and evaluate it and compare it would take years on a desktop computer. These clusters can now do it in months. It still takes a long time to do, but it's in a reasonable time frame. I can do the analysis in my lifetime rather right. than right. not. So right. computers are playing an essential role in this right. revolution. And presumably within the next few years or decade or so, that time frame would be even even smaller. Yeah, we're waiting for yeah. computers to catch up with us. Right. So. Um, you know, really fascinating stuff, uh, and it's and as you say, we're kind of at the beginning of this revolution. Did you had you back when you were a student and and figuring out what it is you wanted to study and and what you wanted to do for your career? Did you kind of know that this was going to be such a big field, and is that what made you interested in it, or or what what kind of really attracted you? Well, I got interested in biology because my father is a small town veterinarian, and I grew up working for him, going out in the field, going out on the horse calls, and helping dogs and. He was also kind of an amateur naturalist. And we lived in the rural Sierra Mountains. And he would take us out in the woods and show us all the names of the blizzards and the ants and the birds and the trees and take us to the beach and teach us the intertidal and actually became quite competitive between my siblings who could name the most species during our trips. So I've always been interested in biology. So when I went to school at UC San Diego, I wanted to study biology. And I took a course in genetics. And it, as Jeff said, I realized this is really important. And my professor was said, this is the future of biology. It's changing, and it's going to change fast. So I basically, I was always interested in biology, and I'm interested in understanding the foundations of biology, which is genetics. So I basically followed that right. cool. avenue. Right. Cool. And in your, in your studies and, and with the variety of kind of cool ideas that you've encountered through your, through your career, is there, is there like a, kind of like one really fascinating fact or, or, or one really cool thing about life that you think everybody should know? Hmm. Well, I think, the gen like you mentioned before, the genetic code is the most fascinating thing to me because yeah. essentially DNA is just using us to go to the next generation. We're just a vehicle for DNA to get passed on. It's just information that we pass to our children, which they pass the same information on. It just goes on and on and on. We're just a temporary vehicle for DNA. Right. <laughs> There's actually a book written about that by Richard Dawkins, so it's not my idea, but that... It's an amazing way to think about right. life through time. The selfish gene. Yep. And, you know, Michael Pollan also had a great book called The Botany of Desire in which he kind of describes how the really successful plants that we are now, we are now growing as our agriculture are in some ways using us to advance their own genes, right? Which yes. is kind of a cool twist of how, how to think about it. He's not a biologist, let's yeah. get that He's a sociologist, <laughs> right. so he's right. hypothesizing heavily there. But uh -huh. it's a great book. It's, it's a cool idea anyway. Yeah. So what are some of the, the specific projects that you're now focused on right now in the lab? Okay. So my interests right now are about population dynamics and hybridization and the consequences of hybridization to endangered species and conservation efforts. So population dynamics is tracking the way genes move around populations. Like I said before, we're all different. And the reason we're different is because our genes have different variations or varieties. So our mother has one variety, our father has another variety, and they come together and mix and create new varieties. And so we can track these varieties as they move through populations. We can also track when animals hybridize, and hybridization is very common. It's not like the donkey and the horse producing an in -stero a sterile mule. Hybridization happens all the time, and especially in turtles. And so one of the problems with hybridization is that new genes get introduced into a population, and that gene might overwhelm the other genes and become fixed. That is the only gene that's possible in that population. And over time, you may actually see genetic extinction. If the new invasive species overwhelms the endangered smaller population, the genetic composition of the original local population will vanish, and then so will the species. So this is a legitimate concern. So we're trying to find, using all the genetic data, as much information as we can about the dynamics of genes in populations and between populations so that we can help inform policymakers in terms of protecting these endangered species. And one of those particular species that you're talking about is the red-eared slider turtle. Yep. Um, I think we have a map here of places that you're collecting data about oh, an yeah. in, uh, this invasive species. So what's, what's the status of that project? So this is the red-eared slider. It is common to the southern east end of the United States. 
but it is farmed by the millions all over the world, and it is found on every continent except for Antarctica. In fact, right here in Golden Gate Park, every pond you go to has red-eared sliders sitting on there, stealing basking space from the native turtles. They carry disease, and they compete for food and mating spaces and basking spaces. So they're actually decimating the native California turtles. It's not just California, it's all over the world. And the primary problem is that in terms of the pet trade, these things live for 30, 40 years. It's not like a small cat or a dog. You buy a turtle, and then it, you're 40 years old, and you still have the turtle. And people <laughs> let them go, and they are very hardy, and they'll reproduce very rapidly. They'll hybridize with the locals, and they're causing a huge problem. And this is sort of the sampling strategy that we are currently have. Um, and you see the different colors or different species of this particular genus. So we have hybrid zones here, and we have hybrid zones here. These are natural hybrid zones, and we're studying the natural hybrid zones to understand how those are maintained and how we can... Um, apply conservation efforts to the non-natural hybrid zones. Right. So in addition to this kind of cool applied work that you're doing studying the turtle, you've also got to go on a couple expeditions through the Academy's uh, you know, research expedition um, uh, organization. And one of those recent places was Sao Tome, which is in the Gulf of Guinea of Africa. If you can kind of make out that map here, we're looking at uh, the western part of Africa. You can kind of see Nigeria there at the top. And Sao Tome, the island of Sao Tome and Principe are right there, kind of um, nestled in, as islands right off of the coast there. What were you doing and, and who were you working with and, and what was the purpose of this trip? Yeah, so the expedition to Sao Tome is an ongoing project. It's been going on for about a dozen years. We go back every year to basically evaluate the biodiversity. We're trying to find a biodiversity baseline. What's there? And the key is, why is it there? These islands are oceanic islands. They are never connected to the mainland. They basically erupted out of the sea in the middle of nowhere. So how did life get there? That's the big question. And so what I study besides turtles are limpets, something else with shells. A limpet is a tiny mollusk that you see on the beaches. They sit on rocks like that. You've probably seen them. And there have been no records of limpets from there, so I decided to go there myself and look for them because limpets are found on every island everywhere in the world. And it turns out on none of these islands did we find any limpets, not a single limpet, which in itself is interesting because there are shrews there. There are lots of animals that can't cross water. How did they get there? They probably got there by rafting and being carried by other organisms. So the question is, why are there no limpets? There's two possibilities. One is the rocks there might be... Um, dangerous to limpets. They might have some sort of composition that poisons the algae that the limpets eat on, or the bay is filled with fresh water because a lot of rivers drain in there and the salinity level is very low there. It's, it's almost brackish. So maybe limpets can't survive the water. So we're looking at some more islands. We're looking for limpets along the coastline also to see if they're there. If it's the water, then they won't live anywhere along there. If it's the rock, there's actually a fault line that goes from here all the way straight across. There's a crack in the plate and lava and so forth is erupting and creating these islands. So we'll be able to see on either side of this line if limpets exist. So if it's the rock, they'll live on the other side. All right. Does that make sense, you guys? <laughs> any questions? <laughs> yeah, well, maybe just one last question okay. here before we can get on to the, the questions from our online crowd as well as all of you. Um, you were mentioning earlier some of the some of the, the really the really interesting moment that we're at as far as our understanding of genetics and DNA and, and what might be possible in the near future as far as each of us having our genomes sequenced. That's, that's one really cool, kind of cool prediction of the short term uh, innovations coming up. What, what other kind of things that maybe are n not so intuitive do you think we should kind of look out for or, or maybe expect within the next few years or decades of, of, this, of the developments in, in this field? Well, again, it's the amount of DNA that's being created and the things that we can do with it that are changing mostly medicine, but our field as well, which is biodiversity and evolutionary biology. Um, some of you probably heard about J. Craig Venter and his creation of life. He created a cell de novo. That is, he sequenced from de novo genes that are minimal for life. So he created a cell that never existed before. And so the possibilities with this we don't really know yet, but maybe you can produce a cell that's totally harmless that produces insulin forever, and special insulin, or s genes that people are missing. These are the sort of things that are going to transform medical research. Right. So the so artificial it, life. Basically. It's kind of pl like playing God in some ways, cr creating life, right? Synthetic life. I suppose. Yeah. 
<laughs> okay, don't want to get too philosophical, I, I guess. Um, I want to open it up to all of you to ask some questions. Anyone, anyone have a question about anything we've talked about so far? I know we have one from our online crowd. You must have some questions. Yeah, there's got to be something. <laughs> right, let's go here then first. Can, oh, that's a great question from our online viewer. Can uh, genes be tricked into kind of switching the uh, production? Can you say that again? To reverse the production in cancer cells. So if it's a genetic problem, they can't really change the, the genes inside of every cell of your body. There are millions of cells, and each cell has this, the DNA in it. You can't go through and change all the DNA. But what you can do is you can... You can augment it by inserting maybe cells that can produce the protein that you're missing. What it is is you're missing a protein or the protein's faulty. So you can add something that blocks the bad protein or produces the proper protein. So that's sort of genetic or gene therapy is what it's known as. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do you have a question? No? Just stretching. Okay. <laughs> uh, next question, anybody? Yes. Yes. How would the proteins be delivered and made effective? So there's a number of methods. You can just do an injection, and your body will, your bloodstream will deliver them. They go through, they're permeable through the membranes. That's one way. Um, others want to focus and target specific genes, like your liver cell example. Um, there might be ways to insert DNA using what's called reverse transcriptase. So as you know, HIV is a virus that doesn't have DNA. It has RNA. And in it, it codes for an enzyme that reverses DNA or RNA into DNA. So we use a similar mechanism to actually go into your cells with thousands of these little pseudoviruses and insert the proper genes into your own genome. This only goes to your somatic genes, not your reproductive genes, so it won't be passed on, which is the bad part. But So you may survive cancer, but then you'll pass on that gene to your offspring. All right, yeah. But there are probably many other ideas they have out there that they're working on. It's, it's amazing what's happening right now. Right. If we wanted to learn more about, about kind of, you know, this cutting edge of, of life science research, what do you recommend people do as far as, you know, places to go to find really good information about it? Well, the Human Genome Project actually has a website with all kinds of information and links. They have videos. But you can also just go to Wikipedia. I mean, the amount of information on genome science on Wikipedia is extremely accurate. Not like other things, but it's very accurate, and it's maintained by mostly biologists. So it's a great resource. Okay. I mean, yeah. you can just Google it, and you'll find good information. Right. Okay. Any other questions? We have one here. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, interesting question. Is it true that viruses are not exactly alive? So th the crux of the question is, is how do you define life? If it reproduces, then virus is life. If, it, if it's about having DNA, some viruses don't have DNA. They have RNA. Is RNA life? I would say they are because they reproduce, and they propagate, and they continue, and they evolve, and they change through time. Hmm. So it's all, all it's about It's about how you define it. Yeah. Are there other things like viruses that are out there that are kind of on the on the edge of, of whether they're life or not? Oh, you know this mad cow disease. It's caused by what's called a prion. It's a deformed protein, and when it connects to another similar protein, it deforms that one and it spreads. So it's kind of reproducing itself. Is it life? It's not DNA. It's not RNA. I would say <laughs> no. I would cut the line before the prions. <laughs> right. Okay. Cool. Uh, I think there was another question from the online. Oh, yeah. Cool. If, is there anything else that you would recommend to see here in the museum that would tell us more about, about this type of work? Um, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of genetic and evolutionary biology stuff on the floor, but we're, there are a lot of plans for it. You can go to the Project Lab, which is a behind-the-scenes view of science, and they actually do some DNA stuff there. They extract DNA and they process DNA. So we project the computer screens up on those nice uh, video screens so you can see what the genetic scientists are doing and actually right. watch them play with DNA. 
So yeah. that's one place. Cool, yeah. And and just in a, about a half hour, 1.30 p.m., we're, we'll have a, a demonstration, actually, led by a presenter. Uh, it's called The Sweet Side of DNA, and it'll be, uh, we're actually going to take some, some real-life strawberries, squish them up, and then extract their DNA so all of us can see it. Um, and that's that's going on in a half hour. So if you want to see that, that'll be a really cool demonstration. And there'll actually also be instructions there about how you can do that yourself at home using basic household ingredients, or you can do it in the classroom. So if you want to grab one of those instructions, go to that program as well. And actually okay. right behind us is a Science in Action videos that talks about some of the researchers and all of them use DNA there as well. So. Yeah. All right. Any final question before we conclude? All right. If not, can we give Brian a big round of applause? This Thank has you. been really great. Thanks for coming. Great yeah. to see everybody. All right. And yeah, if you want to hang out with us a little bit more, ask any more questions, come on up and join us. Otherwise, thanks so much for being here and enjoy the rest of your day at the Academy of Sciences. Bye-bye.